And it is now 10 o'clock, so we can call the meeting to order. We have a quorum of board members, including Janine, myself, Ruth, Sheila, Julie, Prudence, and David. And we have guests. The one that always comes is Michelle Waite, all <laughs> the time. Megan Quitter, Senior Recreation Specialist. She's joining us. And Janet Perk is joining us. So welcome to all. I don't see any public that needs to be heard. So has Susan, everybody had a chance to Susan, review the- Susan, I, um, I think that you wanna give Janet the opportunity to speak. Yes, I do, Janet, please yes. tell us, <laughs> tell everybody why you're here. Why I'm here. So to repeat what I said earlier, I've been involved with senior care for about 40 years now from um, assisted living facilities to private care to um, Longmont, I'm sorry, Lafayette Senior Center. So I just, I seem to, I don't know, navigate towards senior care. So I moved to Longmont about a year ago and um, came down to the center to see what was going on and thought, well, I could help here. <laughs> so here I am. Great. Did you come from Lafayette when you moved? I did, yes. Yeah, I'm, so obviously they... from, I'm obviously from England. So I have across the pond experience of assisted living facilities as well as here. And yeah, I was also a marriage guidance counselor. Yeah, I've been around for a long time. So you get to do a lot of things. So, mm. yeah. so, so do you so know Sheila? Is bigger than Lafayette. I'm sorry? So this senior center is bigger than Lafayette. Much bigger, yes. yes. I also took some of the seniors over to Louisville for some classes. Oh, okay. So I'm kind of familiar with their setup too. And I kind of checked out some, some others just to see how they function. So yeah, everybody's different and that's good. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know Sheila, she... Uh has a similar background from way back when. Ah. Yeah, so, so I, you might I want to get over, to know her. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've been over here longer than most people have been born. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when I was thinking about 40 years, I thought, do I really want to stay up in involved for 40 years? <laughs> oh, it's easy once you say it once. Uh -huh. <laughs> Does national health care make it easier for seniors as they age? It's different, very different. I mean, most of the homes are county run, not private. Um, yeah, there are some differences. The one that I worked at um, was, was beautiful. It was at the entrance to a park. Mm. And the kids used to come in, you know, pick daisies and dandelions and bring them into the seniors. and. They used to love to come and visit, so it was a very different atmosphere. But then, uh, that's that's not. I mean, I'd say that's the exception, but there are some pretty grim places. There and are. Was, yeah, yeah, I was looking for somewhere for my mother when she had dementia and was aging very right. fast. Yeah. And I found a, a nice one. They didn't have daisies, but they were they were pretty close to that. But, but I saw some that were not. And I think when it's run for profit, you know, I mean, right. I kind of left the one in Castle Rock because I just didn't agree with some of their policies. So, you know, money, money tends to get in the way when it's run for profit. Mm. But anyhow. Okay, has everybody had a chance to read the minutes from last month? Uh -huh. And are there any corrections? I, I just saw one typo where in the Meals on Wheels um, first paragraph where it talks about fee meals instead of free meals. I don't know if that's, that's about halfway down that big paragraph. So. 
I personally like the female males. But <laughs> <with me>. Well, <laughs> well the secretary then. That's what I <laughs> Prudence, I have a couple of little tweaks. Marsha okay. is always a guest. Oh, okay. And then I think we should add on the second line on Meals on Wheels, a total of 400 meals are delivered daily. Oh, yeah. Period. And then frozen meals, if desired, are delivered for the weekend on Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Susan? Yes, David. Um, I don't really have any corrections. I saw the, the fee thing also, but. I have a, a couple of questions of, about some of the sure. stuff. Is that okay rather than maybe bring it under old sure. business? Okay. Uh, this, these questions probably sound like uh, Senior Citizens Advisory Committee 101, but uh, a total of 450 meals are delivered daily, like you said. Does that satisfy the need in the community? I think I would jump in there, David. I think for those folks who need a home delivered meal, um, it is a good response. I am sure there are people who could benefit, who are homebound, who would benefit from a home delivered meal, who aren't necessarily connected to Meals on Wheels. Um, that's why their project homecoming is so important and oh. reaching people and new ways of letting people know that a home delivered meal is available. So. Okay, well, kind of a related question is, um, I noticed that it says, uh, uh, first, uh, second sentence, last paragraph says, MOW takes no federal dollars. Um, is, is this a non, considered a nonprofit activity? And yes. that's why there are no federal dollars? Well, they are a nonprofit, a 501c3, but they choose not to go after the federal nutrition dollars. They would qualify, but they choose not to go after them. Um, and uh, Carl, they, Katie explained that to the board. Oh, did um, she? I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's really about the paperwork and the restrictions. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. So, but it would be available if the, if the if the if the board or the city thought that that was necessary, you could apply for that sort of funding. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Meals okay. on Wheels could apply if they chose to. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. And Prudence, uh, one other thing on new business number four there, where it refers to cultivate. It says cultivate does not offer this service. I would just put if anesthesia is used. Got it. And I, I just did make another note under supervisors, Teresa Schulte, her last name is spelled S-C-H-L-U-T-E. Uh, that's S-C-H-U-L-T-E. Yes. Can't read my own writing. Wait, oh, you're, so you're it's... You're just messing with prudence, that's all. <laughs> how, are you, how do you spell it? S-C-H-U-L-T-E. Okay. Because I'm correcting it now. Okay, thank you. Other than that... I would uh, ask that we accept the meeting minutes as amended. Do I hear a second? I say yes. Okay. So now we're moving on to old business and 
the never ending foot care <laughs> RFP. It's never, it's never ending. So we're going to move it to January. A few, a few things have come oh. up, which we'll talk about in a minute, but it's moving, it's moving to January. Good work. Position update. So uh, we have uh, super excited to say Martin Hernandez is coming back as our yes. custodian. <laughs> so he starts Monday. Yay. Oh um, my God. Michelle, yeah. can I ask what, what the conditions were that he decided to come back? Um, uh, you know, it's, um, I don't know that I sh I'm free to share that, Julie, but we are just so excited he's coming back. And so he comes back Monday. Um, and then now I'll focus on the nighttime custodian position, which has not been my priority. And then um, we have made a conditional offer uh, for our office assistant position. And I am just waiting for the last uh, hurdle uh, to make that a final offer. And so hopefully this individual will start soon and um, it's looking really great for that person. So really appreciate uh, the help with the hiring. Thank you, uh, Susan and Ruth. And so other position updates, um, we do have a full-time counselor position that we will be able to fund in starting in next year. And so I'm hoping one a board member is interested in um, helping us select that a person for our counselor and um, Julie and Susan, great. And then the second part of that is um, we will definitely do role plays with the counselor position. And so oh. if that is something you are good at and want to be a part of, please let me know. Um, we, Prudence, you don't like that idea? Well, I'm, I'm quite Questioning its legality. Oh, well, nobody stopped me that. Because <laughs> usually you, you can't give a test well, um, it, beforehand. We, we so, um, hmm. you know, you. I've never heard of role playing. In an interview? In an interview. I have done it for years. Yeah, standard I, practice. You know, yeah, I, I've, done, I, I've done it too. I don't think it's illegal. No, and especially well, thinking is one thing. So, can we have someone take a look into it? Because yeah, I'm not it, really sure. I will okay. check with HR, but nobody's ever stopped me. So, yeah. and especially <laughs> in a mental health role, it is a very, very common interview uh, technique for for anyone that's going to be involved in mental health work or counseling. As long as it's job related, I don't think it's a problem. Right. So we'll, so, we'll I'll check it out, Prudence. Yeah, check it out. Thanks. Um, so we, we have the counselor position and um, we have a former employee who is also a theater major who is always our fallback for role plays. But if Julie, if you are Susan, are comfortable and if we get the full green light, we'll, we'll talk to you about that. Um, and then um, new news, uh, Chris Troxell, who has been our recreation coordinator since the end of September has resigned. And so his, um, his last day is December 10th. And so Megan will be reopening the recreation coordinator position. And so, um, a couple of opportunities for the board to participate in some hiring. So the next custodian, the recreation coordinator and the counseling position. So I have Julie and Susan for the counseling position. Is there anybody interested in the recreation coordinator? Yes. Sheila, Sheila Great. And Ruth. And Ruth, super. Do we know why he resigned? Um, no, we actually haven't seen him to have a conversation about that yet, Prudence. We're anticipating he's coming in today. And so we'll, we'll know more after that. Yeah, that's, that's a shame because I, in fact, I just 
sent an email to um, the, the British ladies group um, saying that I was very impressed with him. So as Larry's replacement. Yeah, so Megan's, Megan's shoulders have just expanded to about six feet uh, wide and um, uh, she's carrying a, a ongoing carrying a burden with all the rec programs, but she'll talk about that in a little bit. So that's the position update as I know it today. <laughs> oh. Appreciate uh, the uh, the willingness to jump in and the questions. So Prudence, I'll I'll shoot that shoot that around to HR. Okay, with that great news, we're moving on to. C, respond to Carmen's question, read equity and inclusion. Yeah, so I just, I got, a, I got some feedback from Carmen after our last meeting and I sent her what your messaging, what I heard from you all. And Carmen wrote back that she just felt like you all were an example of how to lead the way for boards and commissions regarding equity. Um, and she is hoping to come back to you all to talk about how to build equity into the orientation for boards and commissions um, and better facilitate my role, better, better educate the folks who are in my role as a staff liaison about how to support boards and commissions around decision making. So I think she is just looking for a green light from you all to come back and pick your brains around the orientation uh, process as well as what you need from a staff liaison. And this is again focused on equity, uh, the equity work. So my suggestion to you all is you're gonna have a new staff liaison some point next year, but the orientation will be happening soon. But I don't know that any, any of you all are going through the orientation, but I would recommend that we put on an agenda, perhaps March or April, to come back and revisit the equity piece, the city's work around equity, as specifically as it relates to boards and commissions. And I just wanna check that out with you all and, and make sure that seems like a, a good plan. But um, any thoughts or comments about that? Janine. Um, the um, orientation that I did with uh, Boulder County area on aging had a rather extensive presentation on equity and they may be a good resource uh, for just kind of looking at their outline um, it was really almost an hour's presentation, uh, and it might just be helpful in developing our own uh, orientation process. Janine, can you send me the basic, if there was an agenda or a basic outline for that? Or can, yeah. I, could, I could get it, I guess, from... Uh, I, what I'll tell you, Michelle, is I will look, as you found out this morning, I am way too quick with my delete button, and I might have <laughs> deleted it, <clears throat> but I will, I will, in fact, um, look for it. And well, I, you know. I think the staff person is coming back off maternity leave soon, and I can certainly touch base with her Yeah, as well. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think we'd like to have Carmen back in the spring. That sounds like a good idea. All right, well, we'll keep keep it this out there. I, um, I was really appreciative of her seeing you all as leaders in this way. And, um, and uh, so I think she wants to continue to sort of cultivate learn what you know and cultivate that relationship with you. So thank you. So. And do we have any other questions, comments about old business? So then we are moving on to new business where Megan comes in.
You're muted. Good morning. <laughs> He's off. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's good to start to recognize everyone's face now. Well, um, it says to start with an introduction of myself. I've been now the senior recreation program supervisor since about Thanksgiving time 2019. So it's been quite a ride to go through COVID and now to see the senior center reopening. Um, we're about half uh, of foot traffic in the door that we had from two years ago. So people are starting to come back in person. We're also getting requests to keep some of our online programs. Uh, and we're looking at ways to do that the best way so that the sound and the video quality is professional. Um, but doesn't take up too much manpower or um, you know it's not too inconvenient we've been looking at possibly doing that in the front range um, community college but running back and forth might be um, well too much right now it'll be better once we have two people back on staff again um, but there's a whole lot of new things that we're doing for 2022 that hopefully will bring more people back um, we've got programs with the Colorado Learning Center of Human Anatomy, where um, Bev Boyer, who used to work with LUH and do massages here and some of our other medical treatments, she just uh, works right down the street. And so we're going to partner with her on some new anatomy programs that will be really interesting because she does classes with cadavers. Um, so that's one thing that we'll be doing that's new. I have 80 tickets to Hamilton in March that are really Ooh. new, so that'll be great. Mm. Um, with different price ranges so that we can accommodate people of, you know, all income ranges, hopefully. Um, what else have I got? We've got um, a lot of new um, instructors coming on and trying out new programs and seeing if they like to do it on Zoom or in person. Um, looking at more of the health programs like spine and dental. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of reasons to come back. We still have all of our typical history and science programs. We have this great partnership with CSU and that's gonna continue even though one of our, one of the instructors is gonna retire from CSU this year, but she's gonna continue volunteering with them and with us to do these programs completely free for them. Like they're not charging us anything. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of helps us with having programs where people can get out and take natural, nature walks as well as the more strenuous hikes um, so it just kind of um, gives us more ability to reach more people of varying ability levels. And um, <clears throat> with that, um, since COVID, we've noticed that um, we do need to work on more uh, drivers for our minibuses. Uh, we have three that we can work with, but one is mostly committed to child, youth, and ser uh, family services, but I can get them occasionally. Um, and then we have Chuck and Billy who are great, but they're just not always available. Billy driving and um, Chuck's just getting on in years. And so he can't stay out too late at night, that kind of thing. Um, so I'll be looking for more drivers and also trip escorts. Oh, sorry, Julie, yes. Are the bus drivers volunteers? No, ma'am, they're, um, they're paid. Gotcha. We do have volunteer bus drivers, but I don't currently have any volunteers working with our population or customers directly. Um, but we have volunteer drivers for the softball teams. Um, there's one group that might have a volunteer driver. She's a part of that group, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. She would have to be recertified. So um, the, impact, the impact of that is um, we were not able to pull together a snowshoe guarantee, a snowshoe program this winter because we didn't have a driver comfortable doing the mountain um, trail uh, driving with the, the vehicles. So. Uh, that's an, one example. So, uh, and we're not alone. Via and RTD and everybody else is having driver shortages. Right. Uh, even DIA is having DA driver shortages. So, did you notice DIA gave their custodians a four dollar rage three hours after they called a strike? I thought that was <laughs> unbelievable. I am so excited about that because it's my next push for our custodians. I uh, know. <laughs> Um, Megan, can you repeat the name of the person um, that's going to teach the Colorado human body? Bev Boyer, Beverly Boyer. 
It's Colorado Learning Center of Human Anatomy. And it's at B-O-Y-E-R? Correct. Okay. And Megan, are you concerned or are the buses up to standard for winter driving in particular? Yes, uh, they're, they're managed and maintained by our fleet services. And so that's all handled by fleet. And I'm in close contact with Jackie and with Debbie who work at fleet services to make sure that, um, yeah, they're absolutely road ready and their heaters are working and all of that too. Um, so yeah, and then trip escorts, we need to get some more trip escorts. Just some of ours are, um, you know, some people have embraced coming back full time. A lot of our venues have requirements for vaccines and masks that we need to make sure that people have their ID as well as their vaccination card when they go to these venues. And it's, you know, there's a lot more responsibility that we're requiring of our trip escorts. Hopefully that they'll be able to make phone calls to make sure that people have those documents with them. Um, and fewer trip escorts are involved just since, uh, you know, the past year and a half with COVID and everything. We just don't have the same number. I think I'm down four or five fewer than we had mm -hmm. two years ago. So um, if you guys know anyone that wants to be involved, I would really appreciate any volunteers that you know. Um, that's, that's the most of it. It's just making sure that we are adapting and staying current and that we're offering programs that are needed and that um, in the changing climate of post COVID world that we're uh, serving all of the needs of our community. Mm. I mean, some of those hybrid, hybrid programs will be nice for people that just don't wanna drive on snowy roads. It doesn't necessarily have to be because of a pandemic, but we just need to make sure that we're meeting everyone's needs at their level. <clears throat> We need to get some snow first. No okay. kidding. We need snow. Yeah, I just saw that a friend of mine uh, works for Crested Butte and they're just really struggling with their, their uh, vacationers. <laughs> on, a, on an interesting note, um, we did have a customer want us to advocate for that person that for the venues that are requiring COVID that if they had a note from a doctor that said they were compromised and couldn't get a vaccine, they should be allowed to go. And um, I said, no, I said, no, where that, you know, this is the venue, any venue is going to have restrictions and we were not going to get in the middle of that role, that advocacy role. But, um, at, you know, I think there are folks who are going to continue to push in different ways around those rules that some of the venues and obviously some of the regulatory agencies are setting, but it was an interesting uh, conversation I had with that individual. But Deneen? You know, I am especially concerned now with the new variant um, that uh, people need to be ultra considerate um, because we don't know where we're going with this new variant, but uh, I think it's definitely going to increase risk. Uh, so masks especially are, are really going to be mandatory. Prudence. Um, you know, if carrying that, you know, usually you don't carry your Medicare card. Um, and you may not want to carry your COVID card. So there is an app, My Colorado, um, that you can download. It's good for Android and iPhone. Um, and when you download it, um, there's a QR code, which Sheila turned me on to, as well as you could then, if you press, you can also see the person's actual card because all vaccines are reported to the state. I have that too, Prudence, but um, it hasn't updated that I've gotten my booster, and I don't know what the delay is between those those time periods. Yeah. But my yeah. phone, if, even if you just take a picture of your card with your phone, most venues yeah. will accept a, a photo. Right. Yeah. You know what I've noticed with the booster is that it, um, if you got yours at Walgreens, 
Walgreens takes an enormous amount of time to submit to the state. Um, so I waited. I mean, I got my booster back in September. So it didn't appear until probably the end of October, beginning of wow. November. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I did mine through Kaiser, but it's still been a couple weeks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, kind of, it's kind of a strange thing. I'm not sure why. I mean? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay any questions for Megan before we let her get back to work with her six foot arms <laughs> <laughs> thank you Megan for thank you, giving us that please email me if you guys have any input or suggestions I would really appreciate it and be open to it and um, thank you for having me and keep doing all the good work Okay, I'll check out the cloning factory. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. And let's see, then we're on to counselor interviews, which we pretty much covered. And the friend's budget. Susan, I don't know if you want to jump in at all on this, or if you want me to sort of take the lead. Um, you can take the lead on that. Okay. So um, we met um, last week and the friends approved a budget of about $160,000 um, for the friends for 2022. Um, the significant, I guess, changes and Janet, I'm happy to answer any questions actually for anyone about the friends and the relationship to the senior center and the budget process. Um, that amount of $160,000 budget will necess necessitate about $123,000 transfer from the investment account to cover those expenses. Changes from past years is we are going to increase the operating budget from $40,000 to $45,000. So that is a $45,000 uh, gift from the Friends of the Senior Center to the City of Longmont Senior Services operating account. So doesn't have a lot attached uh, to it other than the two staff partial staff positions. Um, but we upped that from $40,000. Um, the other increases that we made um, were around our Latino outreach. And so we increased that to almost $10,000 from about 6,000. And that is actually gonna be for a part-time bilingual, bicultural staff person to do our um, end of life programs that are done in Spanish, but also educational and recreational programs in Spanish. And so for example, uh, we've been doing a couple of Loteria, uh, which is like bingo, kind of. Loteria. And fo the, the folks who are coming, it's not limited to um, Spanish speakers, but um, it is delivered in Spanish. Um, and we have had some folks who are in the Spanish conversation club coming to Loteria because they can practice their Spanish also. But it's been very fun and very popular. So we'll continue to do the Regalo de Paz, which is the end of life programs, some recreational, and then some educational resource kinds of programs. And so really appreciate the friends' support of that. We also increased um, our wellness mo money, and, and Megan will be managing this from 5,000 to 7,000. And we're really going to focus those extra dollars around fall prevention and um, hopefully really looking at how we could partner with some PTs or OTs or perhaps purchase a balance machine, something, uh, so that we can really put some strong emphasis on fall prevention programs. Those are really um, 
big ones. And then the last significant change is we are actually going to increase our emotional support programs to over $8,000. So that's also very exciting. And um, that is really our savvy caregiver education programs, our lunch bunch uh, social programs for people with early stage dementia, and a lot of our caregiver education and support programs. So the friends, have, I mean, we made reductions also, don't get me wrong, but those are kind of the focus areas going forward and um, very excited uh, about that. Uh, we have some board vacancies on the friends board. Uh, I have a couple of folks who've expressed interest. Um, Ruth Waka, a former employee is interested in coming back. Uh, Teresa Schulte, uh, another former employee, is interested in being on the Friends Board, and we have a couple of community members. So the Friends will be kind of pulling those things together uh, for their annual meeting in January. The advisory board members are always invited to that annual meeting, and it will be January 25th at 3 o'clock. So I'm very excited. I feel very good about this budget and um, really very, very excited uh, about some of the more specific focus areas we're, we're investing in. Susan, do you have anything to add? No, just kudos to the friends for identifying how important emotional support is and how important fall prevention rather than picking up the pieces. So important. Any questions or comments? And, and if you have questions about the friends and how this works or questions about the budget, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm happy to address those. Yeah, Janet. Janet. Doesn't the Boulder Agency on Aging have a program for balance, which includes falling? It does. They're a matter of balance program, but they yeah. They, put it on hold during COVID. Oh. <laughs> so we're, we would love to restart that. Yeah, that. that's a good program. And then um, UC Health here in Longmont has a balanced program called Stepping Up. Um, I think that's it, Stepping Up. Yes, excellent. Because and, that's all part of folding. I mean, you right. know. So, so Megan is involved in both of those efforts. Okay. Um, and the focus has been sort of um, fall prevention month is September. And so we, the friends have sponsored free Tai Chi classes all of September, as an example. We really want to look at doing something ongoingly because, you know, with right. any, any health thing, it's not a once a year kind of right. effort. Right, right. Have some sustainability. So right. that'll be an area Megan will be working on next year. Okay. Um, and hopefully bringing matter, hopefully matter of balance will come back. Um, UC Health has indicated they want to hold the stepping up classes at the senior center that people are finding UC Health a little too far. I don't know if it feels daunting out there or what. So we're excited for those partnerships mm -hmm. and we want to add to them. And, and we really think that having some availability of a physical therapist or an occupational therapist isn't is an expansion. That's a that's an ad mm -hmm. to fall prevention program. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or or comments about the friends? Janine, you know, I was thinking about the fall prevention programs. Um, it, it, they need to be ongoing and continuous. A lot of people are less apt to do their exercises at home alone. Yeah. And it's kind of like if you have a fall prevention program and it runs a certain amount of, uh, of days, people will come, uh, but they won't continue at home. And the mm -hmm. adage is you've got to use it or you lose it. So perhaps having something ongoing at the senior center will be far more uh, well attended and preventative than just like a six week class. Yeah. Well, yeah. Janet? 
I was going to say, how about including some of those exercises into the silver sneakers? So Megan, you know, we has, could... yeah, Megan has been working with Carla Mathers around some stability classes through okay. sneakers, which is a great option. Thank you, Janet, for saying Yeah, just keep it going each week. Mm -hmm. And then she's been working with um, a couple of instructors. We have the Tai Chi ruler, which you actually... Right use a ruler with Tai Chi. Yeah. Um, and then we have a Feldenkrais class. So we have okay. some different programs. Yeah, good, good. Uh, and our scholarship right now is folks can use $150 towards exercise and wellness programs. Oh, good. Plus another 150 towards any program. And, um, you know, some of the fitness classes are more expensive and certainly right. in OT are expensive. Right. So we got to try to figure this out that we can really make it affordable, um, maybe increase some scholarships, but also look at some different ways of really reaching people about the importance of core strengthening, right. and, um, et cetera. So if right. y'all have any other ideas, please share them with Megan. Yeah, Ruth. Ruth. Does the senior center have gift certificates so that... People can be given a gift at Christmas time for exercise. Absolutely, program. yes. And we have many family members who do that, who come in okay. and buy gift certificates. And then that just goes as a credit into the person's account. Okay. And uh, yep, yep, it works great. Hmm. So, Janine. Janine. Yeah, you know, it might be helpful to have a little article in the go about the fact that scholarships are available or gift certificates are available just as a reminder for people. Thank you, great idea. And maybe as we look at the go, there is there, we could look at our fitness section a little differently and pull out some highlights around the importance of course strengthening and fall prevention. Julie. Julie. Michelle, does the, um, does the go online, does that, can that be updated with new information throughout the, the quarter? Yeah, Ro Robin is able to go in there and we often make corrections because okay. sometimes we miss things. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So okay. we, we have the ability to make some changes, not necessarily extensive ads, but we can, we can go in there and fix things and so would they <clears throat> would they be able to um for instance what janine had just mentioned you know would, would she be able to Robin be able to go in and, and adjust something so that people could see about the no but what we could do is on our landing page we could pull out some notes and so as you before you open up the go we could do some things with there yeah absolutely okay and prudence. I think, you know, Megan said earlier that she was um, looking at also, you know, not the strenuous hikes, but hikes that people can do. Um, and, you know, it's balance is just not taking a class because I think people have brought up that people don't do their stuff at home. Many of us don't, it's not just people, but all of us. Um, so it could be that easier types of walks also puts into practice their balance. Yeah. Um, she may need more people to support her during that time <laughs> on yeah. bikes, um, but it's then putting it into action. Cause I think if people just see it in a vacuum um, and, and they don't see it as practical, let's say. I uh, think there's also something to be said for learning how to use a walker or a cane yes. correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that doesn't diminish your own ability to balance yourself. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different ways we can go with this. Um, and I'm looking to some expertise from PTs and OTs to kind of boister that, so. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. Cause you know, you see people in the community with their walkers and inevitably it is the wrong height. Um, <laughs> it's kind of amazing to me. It's like, I want to walk up to them and say, you either need to, you need to make this higher. 
they're like yeah. bent over using yeah. their walker, and then they stand up. It's like, okay, wait a minute here. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when I had a hip replacement and I had a walker for a little while, but then I used a cane and I was, I was putting it in the wrong hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't, any, I didn't know any better. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and footwear. I mean, footwear is huge. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's it for the Friends budget. Um, I'm excited. And um, Megan will just need a companion to help her make all these programs happen. <laughs> Lucky Megan. Any other new business? Well, I want to just say, because I haven't seen Marsha come on, but um, she is your liaison. So uh, she did, she wanted you all, is what she said, and she evidently got you all as the city council liaison. So um, is that uh, two more years, uh, Marsha will be your city council liaison. Correct. And then, um, December 14th, um, I haven't flipped that calendar. Uh, December 14th is when they will appoint uh, the officially the new board members. They are doing interviews um, prior to that. And then the December 14th council meeting, um, all boards and commissions will be appointed. So that's what's kind of coming down the pike um, for Marsha in that way. So looking good that we'll have a new face or two in January? Or faces will continue. <laughs> oh. All right, thank you. Uh, did you more or less give your report throughout the meeting? I did not, I have a few extra you things. You have more. I do. Um, for someone asked about the parade, it is at five o'clock on the 11th. And so it kicks off from Roosevelt Park and um, we have six or seven staff members who will be helping with the parade. So we will be scattered throughout the park and on Main Street. There will be no indoor activities um, this year. <clears throat> so Santa will be in the Rose Garden, not inside the senior center. And Santa's workshop will be under tents in the park. So um, park looks lovely. Uh, it, it's really it pretty. Yeah. So that's a parade. Um, Janet, you mentioned that you were a, a marriage and family counselor. Uh -huh. so I just want, um, made me think, we do have a volunteer peer counseling program that is managed by Brandy Queen right now, our licensed therapist. And we will be doing a peer counseling volunteer recruitment next year. And um, the, uh, there are currently 11 peer volunteers and Brandy will be, we will do, we will be doing that. So that's, okay. that's coming up if in case you're interested, just to let you know. Okay, and, thank you. If you want any more information, just call me or email me. Okay. Um, anybody. Just ever. watch out. Once they find out you'll do one thing, they'll ask you for more. Susan, you're not helping. <laughs> I, I am retired. I'm happy. I've been stuck oh, in this with COVID. <laughs> I'm ready to get back out and meet some people. <laughs> it's a wonderful group of folks. The peer counselor volunteers yeah. are really great. Um, Robin uh, attached a summary of sort of statistics and how we tell our story it was really supposed to go to the staff for the next level of review right. <laughs> however however if it is something you all are interested in you read it you're curious you have suggestions it's not a private kind of thing um, but i'm happy to talk more about statistics and telling our story if that's something you would like on a future agenda totally uh, open to talking about that. So um, we uh, we don't do um, outcome stuff very well. That's not my forte. But um, anyways, if you've got the ideas, I'm happy to, to talk about that. 
Um, we have been having continuing get acquainted. We had seven people at the November get acquainted. If anybody would like to make phone calls, I'd be happy to make the sheet available to you. Um, so Susan, you're you're up for making some calls. Okay. And my friend there, Ruth, said she'd do some too. All right, and Ruth. Okay, so I'll divvy up the list and send them out to you. How's that? Sounds good. Okay. Um, our March, April, May newsletter is due by the end of December. So um, <coughs> Megan is busily working on things like softball and hikes and Brandy is uh, figuring out our new counselor position. And we're hoping with the counselor coming on board in conjunction with our peer volunteers, we're gonna be offering some new um, time limited groups some support groups. So might be in as an example might be a group for single and widowed men or it could be you know some things that we haven't been able to do uh as much uh that we like doing so we'll um we'll see how the spring unfolds and where we go with some of those kinds of things um continuing to look at the lha uh, longmont housing authority senior services partnership and relationship and um, COVID has really made things so challenging about bringing residents together. And we're kind of re-looking it again because we had planned to go back into the six senior sites and really do some community conversations. And we haven't been able to do that. So we're rethinking that work again. But our resource specialist who, who is a part of the senior services team and is housed at the suites, the Hearthstone and the Lodge is really, it's going great. And our team has completely embraced her. And the work is, is really in helping people remain housed and thrive. Uh, she is really doing that good work along with our resource team and our resource volunteers like Janine. Um, it's, really, it's really so important and so, um, that's um, what you'll see if you look at the statistics document is how we tell that story um, of helping people not just survive, but thrive. So um, that's kind of going on. Um, I think that's it for me. Trying to think. Michelle? Yes, sir. I got a question. Um, there there's been some discussion about different kinds of support activities, you know, this, yes. this last hour. And I'm just, I'm just wondering, I, I know that uh, depression is a pretty common ailment of seniors. And I don't know to what extent uh, the center gets involved in making referrals, providing help, or, or what they do. Do you have a liaison with a state division or county division of mental health? Uh, maybe that's an old question, I don't know, but I, uh, I was wondering to what extent you try to address those kinds of issues with the senior population. It's a great question, David. We currently, we are the only senior center that I know of that has a licensed therapist on staff. And for oh. us, that's Brandy Queen. And we'll add a second licensed therapist uh, next year that, in that counseling position. And with those, those staff positions plus the 11 peer counselor volunteers, we do address things around depression and anxiety. Um, with that's, That can be done individually, one-on-one. -on -one. We do work with couples. We, um, we're really trying to be creative about how we address some of the isolation depression that folks have, have and are experiencing because of COVID. The peer counseling volunteers came up with lots of good ideas about getting folks out reconnected. Um, and what well, I mean, we talked about, you know, what's it like getting back out into the world? Um, you know, uh, when, you, when you used to walk into a restaurant and sit down and feel fine, and now you walk in and you go, yep, too many people, I can't, I gotta leave, you know, because you're not ready for that. And that's just a minor example of a lot of things people are feeling. Um, so depression, anxiety, 
it are definitely things that we address. We also make a lot of referrals and we have some private therapists who take Medicare here in town and we refer people to them if that's more appropriate. And we also work with mental health partners and some other um, agencies who take Medicaid. And so we Brandy's got a pretty good extensive network where she makes referrals. We have had a wait list, David. We have had a wait list of people wanting one-on-one -on -one counseling. And um, Brandy actually had to close the wait list a few months ago. It's back open, but it is still a wait list. So um, there, there are definitely people seeking support and um, we're doing our best to try and connect them with the resources, either a group or one-on-one -on -one counseling. Mm. This might be a dumb question, but do you need more resources? Definitely, which is why we're getting the second counseling position next year. Yeah. And, and why we're going to be recruiting additional peer volunteers next right. year. Uh -huh. Yep, okay. absolutely. And it. Thank you. Or even, you know, with your coffee chat warnings, could you kind of have a coffee chat around stepping out again and just let people talk? Yeah, you know. we, we're doing a couple different things. We're doing a, auto, a guided autobiography class. Um, we're doing some different kinds of things like a conversation film starter. Yeah. Yeah. Really just different ways to bring people together to have right. some interaction. Because right. yeah. sometimes people don't need counseling. They just need to hear other people talking about the same thing. Right. And be connected. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those those conversation film starters that Brandy does are excellent to get people to talk. Yeah, and bring people in and make them feel more comfortable to just talk about it. Yeah. Yep. Prudence. Um, I want to go back to Longland Housing Authority for a moment. Um, Michelle will love this. So are the new affordable housing across from the St. Verain hub, is that part of LHA? It is not, that's Boulder County. Okay. The second question I have is, um, you know the village place that's right there? That's part, is that correct? That is, yeah. yes. Okay, so can, can you describe, or, or do you know, I should ask, about the parking situation there once the construction is <laughs> completed? Because I've heard a variety of stories about it, and it would seem um, some folks think the, the parking will be very far away. They were told to look on the street, that they're going to close out those circular parking. So I don't know what the issue is there, and even if that's true. Yeah, I think it is complex, which is why there hasn't been a really clear answer, because the Longmont downtown Development Authority actually owns some of those spaces and area, as well as the county. Um, and my understanding is there was going to be a request that some of the new parking in the parking garage might be assigned to Village Place, but I have no idea where that is in the request decision-making continuum. I can absolutely dig on that prudence and, and let you know or, and others in the board know. I know that the construction and then future is the busway that's gonna go from first up Kaufman um, may also impact some street parking. So I think there's a lot of complexity right now, right now because of the construction and expected because of the future work. And I don't have a clear answer. That's the, I should have just said that at the beginning. I know there's a lot going on with that. The other piece for Village Place is that in 2022, it will get a rehab, the building itself. And we have talked about what do we need to do in the parking lot on the north side as a part of that rehab. So there's just a lot of moving parts with that that area. Yeah, because um, I spoke with one of the residents yesterday and, and she's calling someone, I want to say her name is Susan, 
um, or Sandy, something similar to that, um, about the parking situation, because I guess there was a discussion with the, I, I think with the residents, but I'm not quite sure that the parking in the new building um, was that the spaces would be south of in that parking lot instead of right out, you know, instead of north or right outside where the village or inside where the village place is. And that would entail um, a walk for people who may not be able to. I know the residents, I know the city manager is meeting with residents um, on a regular basis. And so certainly Harold is hearing things and, and, uh, and is aware. But as I said, there are a lot of moving, a lot of moving parts. Thank you for that. Can I, ask, can I ask um, an easier question about LHA? Um, are there still waiting, long waiting lists for each facility? So um, what's really great is um, they're doing a wonderful job of opening the wait lists when availability comes. Mm -hmm. And the staff are letting those of those folks in the community who are doing housing referral know when those wait lists open. And so um, Veronica and Amy, Melissa, I think they have several hundred people on an email list. Janine wow. probably knows the exact number, but um, and when they hear of a wait list open, they do a mass blast and yep. um, let people know so they can they can get on the wait list. So periodically they're opening building by building depending and they are getting the word out so that is actually been a real great um improvement is uh when the wait lists open great thank you that's it for me Sue. okay so it looks like we're moving on to janine anything you haven't met we meet on Friday. Okay. Uh, and did not meet last month. So it's been since the first week in October since okay. we've met, but I'll have update next next meeting. Okay. And in addition to what um, Michelle reported on the friends, the annual letter has gone out uh, that's their big donation where they get stuff for Colorado Gives Day, which is next Tuesday. So, and also with the annual meeting, if you have contributed at least a dollar, you're a voting member of the Friends. So please try and attend their meeting on the, what, 26th it is? 25th. 25th. So that's exciting in addition to them getting some new board members. Did you have a question about that, Prudence? So did you say December 25th? January. No, Jan January. January. Okay. <laughs> no, I think people have other plans on December 25th. <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's odd. <laughs> Okay, Art is not here. Susan, if and I then, could, Susan, if I could just jump in. The, the yeah. friends, the friends do participate in Colorado Gives Day, and this year they advertised it with a group of nonprofits in a in a some local print uh, publication. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, that's always an interesting way, of just adding to the the campaign. Sure. And Janine has told me that uh, Julie is taking over the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. Have you gone to a meeting, Julie, or is that going to be next month? I have not gone to a meeting, and I need to talk to speak to Janine about that. Okay. Okay. The reins are being turned over. Yay. Sustainability will be going to David, and that's a quarterly meeting. 
So it you'll is. be going to your first meeting in January? No, I went to one meeting already. The next meeting okay. is February 9th. Okay. And uh, well, let's see, I got a few things to say here. Um, at that first meeting, it was, uh, it was an eye opener, I gotta say. They talked about a lot of things I didn't even understand or knew, <laughs> knew what they were doing, but it's really quite, an, uh, quite a lot of activity, I think. Uh, I think I think Janine may have reported on some of this already. So at the risk of maybe telling you some things that you've already heard, of, I'm, I'll just go through some of these things real briefly. Uh, the uh, this is not something I don't think you'd remember, but during the 2019 legislative session, the uh, the uh, legislature ad uh, adopted a couple of bills, uh, 1261 and 1266 both house bills that uh, stated that uh, organizations, utilities could get a clean air, a clean energy pro uh, program in place uh, if they uh, met certain provisions of the Air Quality Control uh, Commission. And so the Pratt River Power Authority has gone through that to get a, a CEP, they call it. And so to make a kind of a long report short, they did kind of a modeling thing uh, under their under uh, the under the guidelines that they had, and they created a model where they had extreme weather, low power, low water power, low wind power, low low uh, solar power, no wind, no no sun, all that kind of thing to kind of create a worst worst situation. And they found that they could read the, uh, meet the uh, clean air guidelines or what do they call it? The gas, uh, gas house, green, uh, greenhouse gases uh, limitations by about, uh, they could re meet those reductions by 85% to 94% with even in those uh, real bad situations. So I mentioned it because uh, they have, uh, their board, the Pratt River Power Authority, did approve the plan that they came up with, the model that they came with. They submitted it to, to the state and that they will be following it with the state. And I'll report back when we hear more about it. I assume it'll probably be approved. And all that's important because I think it uh, impacts us, all of us. And uh, so by 2030, I think you all have, uh, all have heard that uh, Longmont is going to be is trying to be as energy efficient as possible, maybe 100% uh, non-fossil. Non, uh, I don't know if they'll make that or not, but anyway, I'll keep you up to date on that. And the, another thing is that the uh, Janine probably mentioned that the city applied for a, a grant uh, for electric cars. To, uh, to help in the transition to EV transportation. Well, they didn't get it. But what they did do is they used all that material that they used in the preparation of, for the grant to start planning on their own and probably apply for other grants for uh, electric vehicle uh, uh, transportation and, and the movement towards it. Um, the, the other thing that I thought that would be interesting is they also have a climate risk and vulnerability mapping project. And I thought that was particularly important to us. I don't know what that entails right now, but I'm thinking to the extent that it impacts seniors, that's something that we should know about because if there, as the climate gets worse and it probably will, uh, that's something that maybe should be accounted for in the long range planted plan. That is the kinds of things that we can expect right down to including, you know, local kinds of impacts. And so that's something that I'll, that, that's something else that I'll keep track of and report back periodically. I will say that I was quite impressed with everything that's going on uh, in this community. And so uh, I'll try to keep on top of it. David and, and any board member, if you were not uh, watching city council last night, there were a couple of presentations regarding air quality, including a individual who had a quite extensive slide show 
about various readings, uh, you know, everything from ozone, methane. I mean, it was quite an extensive presentation. It was early in the um, in the meeting, so it wouldn't be hard to find if you were interested in that and wanted to watch it. So you can go on the city website and pull up the council meeting from last night. Um, but there were two different presentations regarding air quality. Prudence? Uh, Michelle, Michelle, I just want to go back to the village place again. <laughs> but, and this has to do with um, air conditioning. Is there air conditioning centralized or is it like the old fashioned kind? I truly don't know. Yeah, I, I think it could be the old fashioned kind, which I, uses a lot I, of energy. What I know is that there are some buildings, Prudence, where there's no air conditioning in the hallways. It's all, you, you know, yeah. unit um, by mm -hmm. unit. And then the other buildings have different, um, like Spring Creek and Fall River are supposedly more efficient than mm -hmm. the older buildings. And I don't know what's gonna happen as a part of the rehab next year. Um, I would imagine they're going to try and go as energy efficient as possible. Right. Um, but I don't, I don't know those details. Yeah. Cause that, that's a, you know, because it's, it's their city owned, you know, uh, they could put in swamp coolers and be just as effective on, you know, because of the low humidity. So I was just thinking of that in terms of sustainability. Michelle. Just one more thing that, um, are you okay? Yeah. Um, it, it was, apparently it was an issue a meeting or two ago about Costco, the new building, whether they were going to try to do anything as far as solar paneling or uh, anything to reduce the impact on environment with their building. And the short story from what I've heard so far is they don't know yet. Yeah, Marsha might be more knowledgeable about that. I'm sorry she's not here. Mm. Um, but yeah, these are these are important questions um, for sure. Susan, I have two ads. Um, if when when the board is done, when you're done, that looks like Janine was going to raise her hand. So, Janine. I, you know, I was just going to add um, that I believe in one of the previous sustainability meetings, um, the, um, it, you know, Marsh is, is also um, on that committee and she mentioned that future subdivisions and, and future buildings will have to um, have energy uh, that's appropriate for, for the new goals with the city. So they won't have gas av available and they will probably not be looking at electric uh, because of cost and limitations. So there's a good chance that any new buildings will definitely be looking at energy efficient uh, systems like solar. Um, and also I was gonna say about Village Place, Prudence, I haven't seen any boxes hanging out of windows there. So they must have some kind of a system that if they have one that's inside, and the other thing that in, in, to consider with, with the renovations that monies are available now, grant monies are available for um, energy efficient units. So um, <clears throat> I would suspect that the goal is going to be to do something, whatever that's gonna follow the new energy efficient guidelines uh, for any reno for the city or any new uh, building permits uh, for companies. Ruth? David, I have a question. Have they 
talk anything about water restrictions coming up in the coming year or limited water recall, use? I don't recall any discussion about that, no. Okay. Does that mean we don't care? <laughs> Sounds like, feels like it's the elephant in the room these days. <laughs> well, people are still planting grass. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, the sure. issue is if we don't get any snow this year, which is a good possibility, we're going to have to deal with it very quickly next year, especially mm -hmm. in the spring. Mm -hmm. And even if we do get snow and rain, we need to start being more careful. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking through my notes and uh, no, not a word about water use reduction. Hmm. I mean, I, when I lived in another city, and as far as I recall at that point, there was adequate water. Um, and that was the day we days when we got bills in the mail. We all got little tablets to put in our toilet tanks to see what sort of leakage we might have. Oh. Um, just little things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Can help. I don't know. But we are very careless, mm -hmm. myself included. Okay. Before we go back to Michelle, we'll take a break. Engaging caring communities, that's Janine and me. The big thing is they're going to be rolling out some sort of prototype this month, which I was amazed at. And the other thing is we thought we were done with our input in October, then November. And apparently we're going to be meeting in December or January for the foreseeable future, waiting for a response on that. But Janine, would you like to add to that? Well, <laughs> you know, I have adopted a wait and see philosophy with this uh, because it, uh, I, I continue to have some concerns about it being user friendly and not too high tech for the average person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to the objective uh, that it's going to be a work in progress for quite some time and that there is at least, uh, you know, agreement that things are going to be, be adapted and adjusted uh, to meet the needs of, of the average person because, uh, because I continue to have concern about it's very technical it's <laughs> but um, but I want the average person to be able to utilize it in a way that's going to be helpful for the community. So I will see. We'll see. Well, yes. Jean, if they can uh, make a reservation on the city's rec center thing. They'll be able to do anything if they can't, myself included. <laughs> It's a challenge then. <laughs> well, it's it's more of a, a resource availability site yeah. uh, where if somebody has a need uh, that they'll be able to hook them up with a resource and vice versa. Uh, the other thing that I continue to have concerns about is the whole confidentiality issue and who's going to have access once you register online with this particular site, who's going to have access to all your information that you put there? And, um, and we're assured that there's going to be confidentiality, but, uh, but that's all. Yeah, I'm paranoid. It, I always worry about it. So we'll see. We'll see. So Janet, just so you know, Janine and I have been working since, I don't know, summertime at least with CU Anschutz 
coming up with a system that's going to be programmed into the computer, but will have, if people need advocates or proxies to get in, all your personal information should be registered there and shared only with the provider or concerned party that the registered person would allow. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a work in process. We've been fishing for words and vocabulary and how exactly it's gonna work. The other thing one of the computer gurus told us is, well, we're gonna be rolling it out, but usually in the computer literate staff people, it's not till version three that it becomes right. usable. <laughs> so it's a work in progress. Right. Michelle, we're back to you. So I'll just uh, end on a couple of good notes. Um, I uh, last, I was at city council last night because of two uh, financial awards and um, council approved both. So next 50 is uh, providing $15,000 to purchase fire stops. And it's a device that goes over a traditional stove hood and um, puts out a fire on your stovetop. So um, oh. with $15,000, we will be able to do fire stops in all of the senior properties and some other apartments in a couple of the other properties. So really excited and kudos to Next50. I uh, really appreciate their support. The second was um, an intergovernmental agreement with Boulder County Aging Services, uh, the Area Agency on Aging, for $45,000 uh, for direct support of older adults. So 35,000 goes uh, for, for older adults and 10,000 actually for caregivers of older persons. Oh, so nice. this is really in the area of basic needs and our resource team will be the, um, the individuals vetting those requests. And um, so both of those got approved, super excited. Um, really appreciative of both Next 50 and Boulder County Air Agency on Aging. So, forgot though, that was just last night. I must be brain dead, but anyways, um, yeah, that's exciting. Anything else, questions, comments? Deneen. I, I just want to share something that I found out yesterday calling around and to kind of put in the back of everybody's mind in terms of uh, potential need and potential risk in our community is that like everything else, uh, the price of caregiving has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be a barrier for some people. And mm -hmm. we need to be kind of putting that along with everything else in the back of our mind about <laughs> how we're gonna support uh, people uh, and uh, find funds or ways, or at least recognize it as a problem because right. uh, it's gonna be happening fairly quickly. Um, I, I got an estimate yesterday for a caregiver to come and it was in the $70 an hour range. And I thought, holy, well, I won't share what I thought, but uh, <laughs> so anybody who has great thoughts or, or solutions, think about it and share it with us. So was the $70 an hour uh, rate for the individual or was it for an agency? It was an agency. I mean, right now the problem is most agencies have limits. Like you have to uh, have a minimum of four hours yeah. or some of them are eight or 10 hours a yeah. week before yeah. they'll even consider uh, accepting the client. And for somebody who may need 
an hour a week, and, and it depends on the activity, but let's say it's a, um, it's an older adult that needs help with a shower once a week, you know, it, it, that's an expensive shower. 70 bucks is a very expensive right. shower. So uh, it, it, the, the fewer number of hours per week dictates the price. And if it's an hour, it's going to cost you a whole lot more than it would be per hour for four hours a week or 10 hours a week. But it does not negate the need that the older adult has. Uh, and it's just, it's the way, you know, caregivers need to be paid more, just like maintenance people. And so it is going to create um, some significant problem and need uh, in the near future for a lot of our older adults. Ruth? There was an excellent program at the Senior Center on Aging in Place. And with that, we got a list of a lot of agencies and with all the requirements, and some do include that minimum three hours at a time, but others were one. Um, I'd be happy to share that with you if you don't have that list. Yeah, I had the pamphlets. That's why I was calling around to find out what the price was. So it's not that you can't find an hour. You can. It's just expensive. <laughs> 70 is outrageous, but yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, so, and, and we can keep looking for, uh, for cheaper agencies. Okay. And it was first and Michelle. Normally those higher rates are for, you know, registered nurses. I mean, the rate goes up according to the qualifications. No, Not it's up there. No, wow. it's, it's considered caregiver. That's and ridiculous. Uh, you know, this organization, well, we're kind of embarrassed to say, but the price that we have to pay, it's gone up Crazy. and, and the caregivers themselves are less apt to want to come for an hour than right. they are to come for three hours. Right. So I understand that, but it's going to create a problem. Right. And part, wow. of, part, of the, part of what's driving this is our uh, current employee hiring market. Right. Um, and so it used to be the home care agencies did not have a minimum number of hours per week. And now there is. I mean, yeah. they're trying to make sure that they have a, a position that is attractive to potential employees. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I want to work 40 hours a week. I want uh, benefits. And so right. I think our home care agencies are trying to put together positions that are attractive to employees. Um, and so that's part of what's driving this is the current market uh, of people who trying to get people who want to do this work. And um, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not that they're pricing these services to make money. I think they're pr pricing it to try to survive as a business. That's, I mean, that's kind of what my, my sense is. Prudence? Right. Sorry. Well, <clears throat> uh, Janet, just to let you know, $70 an hour for a nurse is, I'm not sure if you would get an RA. Right, right. right. Um, <laughs> so I think a couple of things. I think that what you may see is a lot of consolidation in the industry in general to bring down the cost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll see consolidation in the future. I also think, you know, if you think the average caregiver, so let's say they come for, you know, $30 an hour times yeah. four hours, that's $120. Let's say they do it five days a week. So, you know, that's not that much money. It's about $2,400 right. a month, to, to somewhere about $2,500 a month. Um, and I think for the care that's being requested um you know they may have to change their rates till about 40 40 bucks an hour 
including benefits, 40 plus. Um, because I think, you know, we've discussed it here before, is that this is very challenging work. This is not an easy job, even though we can think of it as, you know, prudence needs a shower. Prudence could be very exacting and can be very challenging for her caregiver in terms of her own needs. Now, some states like Washington state has now put in a state law saying you have to have long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I'm not sure how they're gonna manage that. I'm researching that just out of curiosity, whether the state's going to have um, a plan. Um, but long-term care, unless you get it when you're younger, um, is quite pricey. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I'm not sure, some of the health plans now are offering um, caregiver support, um, many of them four hours a week, um, which is just part of the plan. Mm -hmm. So I think that you'll see a lot of churn in the industry. And I think that you know, we were used to paying someone, you know, 12 bucks an hour to do work that is very difficult mm -hmm. and challenging. And I also realize it, it's challenging for the individual who has not planned um, for that kind of cost as they age. And so that would be a very good class on planning your financial future. You know, um, some people are paying $1,000 a month um, because they were in original Medicare and they're right. surprised. And it's like, you know, that's what you probably needed to plan for. So that would be a very interesting cl uh, <laughs> class, planning your financial future as you age and become uh, more... Um, un, um, not able to care for yourself. Hmm. That needs to be a class for 40 or 50 year olds, right, not exactly. 60 to 70 year olds. It's too right. late once they, you need it. Yeah. Right. But the senior center could offer that class for 40 to 50 year olds. Hmm. For the kids. Yeah, because I think they're sometimes surprised. Yep. I mean, I talk to people or I email them and they are shocked when I tell them this is what it's going to cost you. They, they're just shocked. They said for my mother, I said, that's correct. <laughs> and the other problem I see is there are so many options. So when Medicare sends me this email with apparently joy behind it that I now have 27 drug plan options from which to choose, um, I get very angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just so inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I mean, who, I mean, as if I'm not doing another thing in my life and I'm supposed to study 27 drug plan options. Mm -hmm. so it's called keeping your brain active. <laughs> every <laughs> or, year, Ruth, every year. Every year. basket and not being operative at all. <laughs> so, so, and that's something that they're asking you to do every year with yep. yeah. tech renewal, which is why Boulder County Air Agency and aging Medicare counselors are so important um, yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah, it's very challenging sometimes to negotiate all this, for sure. Well, it's one of the reasons we need a better healthcare system in this country. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do seniors advocate for that is ongoing. Yeah. We're kind of so. dismal here. <laughs> Well, I, here's, here's a glimmer of hope. Um, 
we have an opportunity to influence some funding, both at the state level with Senate Bill 290, that is about the health and safety of older adults. And our Area Agency and Aging Director, Christine Vogel, has invited us to share information about where we think that funding will, would be best used. Um, I think personal care, which is the, the items that Medicare won't pay for, um, like showering and like some of those kinds of things in an ongoing way is, is one piece of that. Um, and also through the Friends of the Senior Center and our funding from Boulder County Area Agency on Aging. We already have a dedicated line item for personal care. Um, mm -hmm. And we sort of did it as a pilot here in Longmont just to kind of test the waters, like what would we use it for? What kind of parameters would we put on it? Um, and so we have some opportunity to influence this in, uh, in different ways. And so um, that's, the, that's the glimmer I have is that we're, uh, we'll keep trying to fight for, for this as an important health and safety issue. Thank you. I'm, all, I'm also thinking long term uh, about what's what's what we're going to need to focus on, and it's going to be cultivation of people helping people. That mm -hmm. we're going to need to focus on helping each other as we all get older and uh, looking towards uh, promoting volunteer work uh, in those areas and fighting the, the legality that prevents people from volunteering to help other people. But I think uh, <laughs> in survival, we're going to need to be focusing in that area. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a very small helping other people. I have a small group of friends who are also women living on their own. And every morning when we get up, we send a text emoji to each other so that we know that they actually made it through the night, but also that they're alert and awake. And I had a situation yesterday when um, one friend did not send her emoji for two days. So I called her and she, oh, I just forgot all about it, forgot all about mm. it. And I have actually in the past been round to her house mm. when she hasn't sent her morning text. I mean, that's just a small thing, but it's, it makes, it gives us a little bit of security. Yeah, it's community, it's community. <laughs> I think and it's having a text. Paying attention to each other. I got wind of one of my neighbors. Somebody said, there's blood in front of her gate and there's a trail of blood going up to her door. I said, well, did anybody check it? Oh, no. I was there. Banged on the door till I got in. Texted her daughter. Apparently she's, uh, you know, aging with some difficulty and possibly dementia and OCD. Yeah. So the daughter was out of the country. I called the neighbors around her. I said, keep an eye out. She might need some help. Yeah. But we don't think like that. Well, I general. think that there is, you know, in the United States, there ha you know, I think that with um, generations younger than us, you know, as, as Americans, we think of ourselves as individuals. We're rugged. Mm -hmm. And... Um, now we have to think in a community sense, mm -hmm. and that is a sea change mm -hmm. for the public. Mm -hmm. uh, you could just see by people refusing vaccines, they're thinking on an individual basis and not a community mm -hmm. basis. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all when you know, your poor neighbor, you know, no one asked because that's an individual, you know, that's not part of their community. And I, I think 
in order to be successful in aging, community, as well as successful younger, I don't think it has to do with aging really. Even as a young adult, I think you, you form community in order to have your needs met. I think the other piece to this is about um, how we talk about the role of family and, and, and um, yeah, recently I had a conversation about family expectations around this and how we can support families being family. Um, and so in addition to the individuals who might be aging uh, without family or without intimate uh, relationships supporting them, also how do we help those who do have folks in their lives, but they may need some other pieces of right. support. And I right. think it's both. And um, we have moved away from family expectations around caring for our aging family members. Yeah. and. Yeah. How do we address that culturally is also of interest to me. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It comes back a little bit to Pruden's statement about we're rugged, we're independent. It's all about, you know, move out, do your own thing and take care of yourself. And how do we, how do we rethink that a little bit? So that's my thought about it. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because, you know, sometimes the healthcare system, you know, I have this because I work, um, you know, I have this discussion is that you can't expect a family, you can't expect a daughter, and it's usually the daughter, it could be um, uh, the son, to change their father's dressing. Like, no, it's not how it works. Um, you know, so the healthcare system in and of itself puts burdens on family, Medi what I consider either skilled care yep. on them. And so the families even feel overwhelmed. They just want to be with their parent. They don't want to change dressings. That's not how it works, gang. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's a, a, a circular system almost where there's not support for the community as well as there's not support from the medical community to understand that I'm not going to do that as the daughter. No way. Um, you know, that has to be paid for by someone else. It's not going to be me. I mentioned uh, a couple of meetings ago that uh, I lost my sister-in-law, my wife's sister, uh, a couple of months ago, actually August, I think it was. And I mentioned that uh, he got a lot of a family attention uh, when she died, when she was, and, and immediately before everybody was focusing on John is his name. And uh, so he made it through that okay, I mean, her dying and everything in the first few days thereafter. But shortly thereafter, he just kind of was lost. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, you mentioned a, a source, which I did uh, point him in that direction. But I talked to him on uh, Thanksgiving day, just to see how he was doing. And he's still lost. And he's just kind of ambling around. <laughs> he says he goes around the house talking to his wife. And I believe it. And I guess I bring that up only because uh, I, I don't know what to do about that exactly, except uh, there are resources available, but here you have a person that doesn't really have the wherewithal to take advantage of them unless there is somebody there. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, that's an unresolved problem with me and I'm, I don't think it's that unusual. Ruth? Well, the other part of the equation that I have found as sort of a part of a caregiving team is that my sister-in-law doesn't want anybody. She needs, they need, she and her husband, 
but she doesn't want anybody in her house. She doesn't, she doesn't want to move. She intends to die at home. And I certainly respect that. Mm -hmm. But this individual, I can do it. I can do it. You know, if we right. fall, we'll help each other up. Well, they can't. You know, they're 91 and 93 and she's extremely frail and he has some dementia. and They don't want help. And so then it becomes the burden for the, those of us that care is how do you allow people to age the way they choose, even with the risks? Mm -hmm. um, and when, when is it um, somebody making a choice from a cognitively intact place? And when are they making a choice because they can't make any mm -hmm. other better choices? Mm -hmm. I've just, it is a constant daily challenge for our staff here as we work with older adults and, and our own families, um, you know, around older people are adults and to the degree that they are able to make their own choices, even if they seem risky or how, how do we best support older people in doing that? And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an and ongoing how, conversation. How do we choose them if they're, wish to die, right. you know, we don't have, I mean, we do have a, a law in Colorado that lets us make that choice with medical assistance, um, which is hard to find. So one can choose a slow death. I don't know. Yep, and, and isn't that really what most folks seem to be more afraid of is that journey before right. death right. rather than death itself. Right. And I feel like I have spent my whole career really trying to advocate for older adults to be adults and be allowed and supported mm -hmm. in making their own choices mm -hmm. and supporting them and providing them the resources when met those choices become more difficult right, or right. they are unable. And it is so gray and murky at times that I am so thankful for the team that we have here that we <clears throat> put together and talk about these situations so that it's as ethical and um, and, and we make as good a choices as we can make, but it is, I, it's not easy. Sometimes it's not easy. There's a really lovely book out there. It's called The Brilliant Life of Eudora Honeycutt. Um, it's a little bit like the book called A Man Called Ove, if you read that. Oh yeah. Um, so it's a great deal of humor in this book, but there's some really profound Ah, insights into the process of wanting to die and wanting to live. Mm -hmm. um, just a little book, The Brilliant Life of Eudora Honeycutt. If you want a good read, I certainly recommend that one. I second that. It's a quick read too. Yes. yes. Any other? So, so I'm just gonna say this, Ruth. Several years ago, myself and Peggy Arnold, who was working for Longmont United Health, did a book discussion on being mortal. Um, and um, it is a great way to, to bring up conversations for people. And so I appreciate the recommendation. I'm going to check the book out. And who knows, I might tap you. Maybe you and I could do a program together. Yes. I mean, maybe a book group on these, I mean, a program on a book club every month or whatever on these topics. Yeah. If nothing else, do we have a motion to <coughs> close the meeting? Adjourn? 
So I'll move. Sheila seconds? No. Thank you everybody for coming, for all your comments. I'll see you in the new year. I wish you happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, Boxing Day, et cetera, so on and so forth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. May, may December be kind to you and may 2022 be a, a really even good better. Day. Yes, let's look forward. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks. Happy holiday.